today is tomorrow's history. So if you're there to connect the dots, okay, show them, you know, you know that progression, but you're also there to give them a vision of the future, because with young people, those what I affectionately call the next greatest generations. I think what what drives us, especially the children of the greatest generation, is a belief that there will be future greatest generations. Find more cowbell. If you need more military aviation, well, the good news is you have many options. For example, you could watch a movie like Top Gun Maverick or Devotion, or you could attend an air show, or you could go online and find different shows like the Fighter Pilot Podcast. And by the way, hello and welcome. I'm your host, Vincent Aiello. And finally, and relevant to today, if you have an itch that needs scratched on military aviation, well, then one great way to handle that is to visit any one of the hundreds, maybe even thousands of aviation museums around the world. And here to help us understand today the San Diego Air and Space Museum is Mr. James Kedrick. Jim, welcome to the show, sir. Uh, nice to uh, be here. <laughs> well, I'm glad to have you, and I'm sure this is going to be a really exciting discussion. God, I hope so. <laughs> well, you are, as I understand, the president and CEO of the San Diego Air and Space Museum. I'm looking forward to learning about the organization and its role in our favorite new movie, Top Gun Maverick, and the F-14 that we see on a flight deck. That was a first in many years. But before we do, let's get to know you a little bit. Where are you from? Where did you go to school? And it looks like you served in the military. So tell us a little bit about that. So I did. I uh, was born in Bremerton, Washington. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, certainly a bastion of United States. Navy and shipyard uh, stuff. Um, moved to uh, Edmonds and South Tacoma, actually South Tacoma, then Edmonds, a suburb of Seattle, uh, down to Centralia, Washington, which is midway between Portland and Seattle at age 10. Uh, graduate from high school down there, ultimately University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Right. And um, if you've ever seen the movie An Officer and a Gentleman, uh, I attended Aviation Officer Candidate School back in Wow, I reported 9 November 1971. Okay. I just thought that was Hollywood uh, license. So there actually was an AOCS up there? No, it was down in Pensacola. Okay. So the one was Hollywood license oh, okay. that, that said it was up in, in the yeah, Northwest. Yeah. No, so I checked into Pensacola, Florida, 9 November, like I said, 71. Uh, we did have Marine drill instructors. Uh, it was everything you could imagine from a Marine drill instructor. But I think most of us who, who went through the program there took great pride that we went through a program that did have Marine DIs. Right. Uh, you know, uh, they... Uh, uh, they tested us in every way. <laughs> I, I think the first week I said, this is Jim. I'm here. I thought I was going to be flying airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you ended up uh, going through AOCS. You get to flight school, I guess, uh, as I a did. pilot. I did. I and... did. I actually uh, you know, started there in T-34s right in uh, the Pensacola area at uh, Softly Field, mm -hmm. uh, progressed up to uh, Intermediate Jet, uh, started in Meridian, Mississippi, and then part of the single base concept for the Navy, uh, one of the A-4 squadrons transitioned over to T-2s in Kingsville. So they took 16 of us uh, who were already in stage flying the T-2 uh, because uh, up in uh, Meridian they had the A and the B. And then they had brand new uh, Charlies when we went down to uh, Kingsville and then over to VT-22 where I got my wings. Okay. And then what platform did you select for the fleet? Well, I uh, at that time, you know, we had just stopped bombing in Vietnam. Uh, I was uh, very fortunate to head out to VF-126. Okay. We all selected platforms, uh, but, um, uh, you know, it was just kind of um, uh, seats were – not available. They had, uh, I think, one seat for like 25 people. Oh, gosh. Uh, and it, it may have been an EA-6B uh, because, once again, we just didn't have the, the attrition from the war. Uh, so I went out to uh, to Miramar, which was actually, 
you know, pretty phenomenal. And, uh, you know, then I was what they called a NEFIA, non-fleet experienced aviator, as I came up for, you know, for the next set of orders. And uh, uh, they offered me an F-4 or an A-7. I uh, chose the A-7 um, just for a number of reasons. I I had done a lot of alone sports. I was a wrestler in high school and college and even a little bit in the Navy and chose the A-7. I'm not sure I'd ever seen the airplane. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, ended up, uh, you know, flying, a, uh, you know, a couple times up to Lemoore from Miramar in, in one of our A4s and, um, and grew to love the airplane. The, you know, it was technologically, it was actually superior to any other airplane in the fleet for the, you know, in the, uh, in the day. We had an episode on the A7 and yeah. we enjoyed it very much. Uh, I was surprised to learn about the HUD and the bombing accuracy and how stable it was and et cetera, et cetera. But all right, so how many, is that what you flew the whole time? How many hours did you end up? I did. So I've got a little over 1,600 hours in uh, A7s. I've got over 1,800 hours in A4s. Okay. Wow. Uh, because I, um, you know, flew in 126. Sure. I ultimately then went back to uh, uh, VT-21. I had written verbals at that time to go to the RAG as an instructor, uh, but at that time, CNO said, uh, we're going to man the training command at 100%. Okay. So um, they said, where do you want to go? I just said Kingsville and VT-21, and then I was over at uh, Sinatra staff, Chief Naval Air Training Staff, as the standardization and NATOPS officer for the advanced jet syllabus, uh, which was actually a great tour. I, uh, we had two A-4s there. I scheduled them. I flew them most of the time, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, and then I have uh, um, then uh, the last six to eight months, all of the desks work for me. And, uh, you know, we had Admiral Joe Barth was the first Sinatra. Then Ed Martin, who uh, lived in Coronado, passed away now a few years ago. Uh, but Ed, um, uh, Ed wanted somebody that he liked to fly with him all the time. So uh -huh. I took him in the A-4. And uh, uh, one day he said, uh, he said, you know, because he'll call me Slug. He said, hey, Slug, uh, you know, I don't always want to go in a in a flight suit. Sometime I w sometimes I want to wear my uniform. So why don't you go get called in the T-44? So, <laughs> so I went, okay. So I went to the T-44 guy who uh, was working for me, and I said, hey, you know, uh, the Admiral that just said, uh, you know. So he sent me through, not just to get called, but he sent me through the ITU, the Instructor Training Unit. So I went over, 10 hops, and now I'm an instructor, and... <laughs> The admiral could log time. Uh -huh. See, if I'd just gone in, gotten called, uh, he wouldn't be able to, you know, to, to log flight time. So uh, it worked out for all concerned. Is this, he ended up Vice Admiral Martin? I think they named the he fitness did. center he did. after him. He so did. he was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. He was. Vietnam. He okay. was. And he was just, uh, I love the guy. Yeah. And, uh, and that's why we got along so well. Okay. I don't remember who his flag lieutenant is, so I won't talk about that, but he didn't. <laughs> We got along much better, right. and um, uh, and certainly it was a it was a treat for me to fly with him because I had to fly to all the bases anyway. Sure, you know to fly with their instructors, their students as part of the uh, the standard ATOP job. All so right. it was it was really good. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, so we could certainly spend the whole episode talking about your career. It sounds like a lot of fun, but in the end, uh, how many years, and did you retire? Or did yeah, I did. I retired with uh, 21 years off the okay. Air Force's staff. I was uh, Code 32, Ops and Plans and Force Schedules, uh, something that now Third Fleet does. So we used to schedule all, right. all the carriers, all the air wings, and for the first Gulf War, uh, the task was uh, six aircraft carriers, their air wings, all on station on a certain date, ready to go to war, which we did, and then we had to rewrite the schedules for the next two years, which which would have been guerrilla. Had, uh, yeah. had that war lasted over that 135 days mm. or so, we yeah. would have been, you know, yeah. we would have been bleeding. They would have come home and said, <laughs> "Hi, honey, it's me. I'm home. And I I'm go. now. Yeah. I, yeah. I got to go out." Just so the listener and viewer is aware, you said the Air Force's staff. I understand what that means, but that's not the Air Force staff. That is right, Commander, Commander Naval, Naval Air, Air Forces, uh, and of course, mm -hmm. we affectionately call him the person in that role. Uh, you know, uh, Kenny Weitzel today, right. uh, the Air Boss. That's right. And so uh, uh, there was that was the day when Air Pack and Air Lant were kind of equal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's adjusted a little bit it's since changed, that yeah. time. Admiral Weitzel has promised me he's coming on the show because not his predecessor, Bullet, or did I get that wrong? The, the man he relieved snuck out before I could get him. But I had the gentleman before that. I think it was episode 16. And uh, we talked to uh, Admiral Shoemaker about some big picture comments. And that was right when... Uh, so Chip was before him, right? Was, was it, it Chip? Who what, was Bullet? it? I thought it was yeah, Bullet. Bullet, well, yeah. Anyway. Anyway, uh, yeah, well, that shouldn't be. Well, Kenny's a time. really good guy. Uh, he okay? says he's coming. So. Uh, he'll give you All a right. great interview. I, I really believe that. Okay. And we've become very close friends. Okay. And 
Uh, well, I'll have to have you back. You can sit on this side. I can... would love to. <laughs> <laughs> and I had him come speak um, at a couple groups that oh, I'm good. in. All right. Right. So he's very good. So how does a man end up 21 years in the Navy, go to a museum? And if there's parts in the middle that are important, you can tell us, or if you want to skip over that. But uh, Well, there are, uh, because... Um, you know, when I got out, I uh, said, well, do I go to law school finally? Okay. At 40-something uh, years old? Exactly. Uh -huh. And so, uh, but I've always been an event guy. I founded the Fallon Air Show back in 1988. Ah. Uh, directed it even when I uh, uh, moved down to Air Force's staff. Um, uh, I love events in general. Okay. I don't care what the event is um, uh, because, uh, you know, my goal is to ensure everybody gains from it, that they're entertained, that they walk away going, I'd go do that again. And so the topic doesn't matter to me, which is, I think, very critical to anyone who does events successfully, because sometimes you get too caught up in the minutia of the detail, like mm -hmm. an air show. So I've done 13 or 14 air shows, balloon mm -hmm. festivals, uh, San Diego Grand Prix car race uh, that was held at the old Naval Training Center before it uh, finally closed. Um, uh, and I was director of San Diego Bay Fair, the unlimited hydroplanes oh. racing on Mission Bay for eight and a half years, and I'm uh, on their board, so I've been connected with them now for about 30 years. Okay. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I, I always tell people, you don't want to get, you know, so engrossed in getting that B-25 that you put yourself out of business, you know, because you got to ask yourself, if we spend that money, how many extra people are going to come? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so and, and you know, very candidly, uh, an event is like going to war, except you know the date. So you have all the same <laughs> same, same preparation. You're, you're going to do it. All right. And so I, 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 I historically, and all those uh, people that know me well, I say, we don't have any problems. We have challenges. So don't ever walk up and say, Jim, we got a problem. You can yeah. walk up and say, we got a challenge because we have to overcome it. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're committed. That sounds like a good leadership lesson. But I'm seeing a bit of complexity here, uh, Jim, because you said at the beginning you played solo sports, you wanted to fly the A7 because it was single seat. And, of course, I let you slide. But we all know, even if you're in the airplane by yourself, you're never really by yourself. You have wingmen and Correct. all Correct. that. But Correct. that's what we spend time on this show trying to explain. But so, you, but sounds like you, you love an active event and having people around that are having a good time. Well, I do. And I uh, I like team building a lot. Oh, good. Uh, uh, you know, I think that's what it's all about. If you said to me, what am I most proud of at the Air and Space Museum? It's the culture of us, of oh. our organization. Good. Uh, because when I got connected to uh, to the museum, I was actually working for Booz. I uh, I had taken a job up running the running the electronic combat range in China Lake, uh, and so. Uh, moving back into the San Diego area, I went to work for Booz, but I got an email. I don't know if you ever knew Pat Moneymaker, call sign Munt, old Blue Angel CEO. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Munt was an old friend, uh, you okay. know, a Lamoron, and um, uh, he sends me an email and just says, Slug, don't know if this email address is uh, still good for you or not. <laughs> Have something you might be interested in. Call me Munt. So I called him, and he was on the search committee you know, at the museum because okay. there were like 47 applicants and uh, the rest is history. And now I'm in my 18th year there. Oh, wow. Well, so his son was in my air wing when he yeah. had his tragedy yep. in the S3. Yep. And uh, when you said you work for booze, can I just explain for people? Because I'm afraid they're going to think I'm going to owe you a bottle for being here well, today. Well, you do. Uh, well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't want that to. <laughs> <laughs> booze Allen Hamilton, right? So big consulting firm, right. very, uh, right. very large in the military industry. Uh, all right, so let's talk about the museum because that's ostensibly what I invited you to hear for. But everything uh, that it sounds like you you're, you've experienced so far has been exciting. But Jim, I have to ask you this from the beginning because I've got three sons and they they don't care about much except their phones. Sorry, kids. Uh, but you know, do, do people come to museums anymore? I mean, is this a bygone era? Or I mean, I went uh, recently because. Of course, I was uh, invited over to get to know the folks to set up today's interview, and, and I, I, was, I was excited to see everything over there. But I think they're still excited about going to museums. Do I think that is tempered just a bit over the years? Mm -hmm. I have friends who I respect their view mm -hmm. who tell me that when they think of the word museum, they think dusty, a little quiet. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe a little antiquated, a little, 
You know, um, you can't make a lot of noise, you know, that like kind of thing. But we have lots of noise. Yeah. Okay, I encourage sound. I encourage, uh, you know, videos playing, you know, whatever it may be to enhance the story. Uh, interactivity, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing like kids smiling and laughing and playing uh, because, uh, you know, there's a big sign in the front of the Air and Space Museum that says, enter here for fun. Because if they're having fun, Okay, we can do a lot with them. Okay, they're going to, uh, we're going to educate them, we're going right. to inspire them, we're going to, you know, show them things that they weren't, you know, quite aware of. And, and certainly we have a brand new uh, exhibit we just opened on Feb 4 called Above and Beyond, very interactive, uh, something I think that anyone would enjoy. Now, that being said, have I considered changing the name of the museum to something like the San Diego Air and Space Adventure Center. Ah. Uh, uh, just test me sometime because <laughs> it still may come. Because as you float that idea, you know, you're talking to your two sons, right? Three. Three. Okay. Yeah. Well, I had three sons also. That's oh, good. good. Uh, talking to your three sons, if you said, hey, guys, you want to go down to the Adventure Center, they're going to go, well, come on, let's go. <laughs> That's right. Because there's no doubt, yeah. okay, that that word museum has a little bit of a antiquation you know perhaps in it Interesting. and and um, and I know it so if you know it and you believe it you're gonna structure it very event centric mm -hmm. okay because uh, you know once a goal once again you know if you're gonna produce an event like we do the International Air and Space Hall of Fame it's the best evening of honoring aviation and space in the country most likely the world if you've never been I encourage you to go. You will be treated to a wonderful evening. I mean, we have inducted. Uh, I've been there uh, since 2006. Uh, was my first day, first board meeting actually. Um, uh, I'm probably going to tell a story that I shouldn't tell. <laughs> my first board meeting was like December 2005. Okay. And I was um, um, sitting next to a number of people that I really didn't know. This was my first chance to to really meet a number of the board members, like the majority of them. And so I'm sitting next to a gentleman who was a Navy pilot named Ben Cloud. He had come out of, uh, he was a, you know, uh, uh, his heritage was Native American. He was just a great guy. And, but I don't know him, as I'm not sure I knew the guy on my right. And, um, and I remember uh, there was uh, a person, I won't identify who they were, on the board talking about the upcoming Hall of Fame, which was going to be in April of that year. And they were going to have as a keynote speaker a guy named Bob Crandall. Bob Crandall is kind of the chairman emeritus of American Airlines. And since you're an airline guy, the, the name Crandall still resonates in a very positive way with many, many people. And, uh, and he is a good guy. We later on did induct Bob into the, uh, into the Hall of Fame. He was going to be the keynote speaker. They were going to induct uh, three people who had already passed away yeah. uh, from the airline industry. Okay, And mm -hmm. I recognized maybe one of the names, not the other two, and the one not so much. So I, uh, I'm listening to them talk about the Hall of Fame and what they're going to do. And um, uh, the, the first thing they talked about was they had made a decision to not do an invocation uh, because they thought it was antiquated or, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, I, so I'm just listening to this. And uh, uh, then the second one is they were announcing who they were going to be inducting. And so I, um, I uh, probably shouldn't have done this, but I raised my hand and uh, new guy. I did as a, <laughs> as a as an FNG, and we won't explain fully what that is. Thank you. The um, uh, and I said um, I said you know I have a fair amount of experience in producing events, and uh, and I said I think there are two challenges you have. Number one is I've never known anybody to make a decision to go or not go to an event. Um, based on whether or not they thought there was going to be an invocation. You know, if there's an invocation, there's an invocation. You pray to whoever your uh, Lord is, so you know, or yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a moment of silence, whatever yeah. it may be. So nobody worries about that. And so I, and then I said, and I said, uh, and really your primary marketing challenge is going to be, you know, as so I use John Upra, is um, you're inducting three dead people that nobody knows. And that's going to be your challenge. They don't want to see their granddaughter, uh, grandson, you know, whoever it might be. And uh, there was a silence, you know, in the room. I kid you not. I, and I just and I said Who's to myself, why did I say anything? But it's kind of my nature. Well, Ben Cloud. Okay, remember I don't know yeah, yeah. Ben. 
he leans over and gives me an elbow. He goes, well said. And I went, geez, well, at least I got, I scored with one person in the room. <laughs> All I was trying to do, you know, because we're so reluctant now yeah. to express what we believe might be the truth or our opinion. Yeah. You know, we don't want to be screamed down or whatever. And, you know, my intent was to have, and you'll get a kick out of this. So I come in. <laughs> And I actually pushed the Hall of Fame from April to the following um, uh, uh, October or November. We still bring uh, you know Bob Crandall in as a as a speaker, you know, but just do an event. Uh, it was eight, like April twenty. I don't know why I, why I re remember all this stuff. And so we we I decided to piggyback onto the Hall of Fame an award that I created called the Twentieth Century Distinguished Achievement Award. Mm in aviation. And so we had uh, Peter Diamandis, you know, the X Prize, we had Paul Allen, and we had uh, Burt Rattan. And so we we actually made money. Yeah, we were right. successful. So Crandall, that name sounds familiar. Was he one of the helicopter pilots in the Battle of No. 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 Might be Chairman a... Emeritus of American Airlines. Okay. But I think that pilot I, I only I don't I didn't read the book uh, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, but the right. movie right. shows a pilot who was central to that. Yeah, uh, I don't uh, think it was Bob. No, but maybe the same last name. Someone watching or listening. Anyway, so I gave you a long us. story. No, no, I know right. I bored the living daylights out of you. Stories but are it good. was But it was kind of how I was introduced to the museum. All right. Uh, because um, the museum, like many organizations, has its own personality. Sure. You know, we have docents. You know, we have mm -hmm. restoration team members. We have a board of directors. You know, just all those personalities that you can possibly imagine. And... Um, I think it was it was two to two and a half years before our volunteers kind of accepted me <laughs> that I was going to be okay for them yeah. in their hallowed halls. Well, I mean, it sounds like you came in and started breaking some china, but sometimes you have to do that if there's a steady decline. So back to what you were saying before, certain words have certain meanings, at least in people's minds. And so if museum keeps someone away, well, then if you change it, right? Now back to the way I phrased the question, yeah, get me off the phone or yep. my kids off their phones. Yep. Let's get them there where they can touch and feel and Absolutely. smell and, and see and experience. Well, that's why we've got the simulators that you've seen right. there. And we, we didn't have those before. You know, uh, it's got to be very experiential. And that's why, you know, event philosophies actually work in something like that. Yeah. You know, we have the 3D, 4D theater. You know, that was funded by... Um, uh, Walt Zabel, you know, over at Cubic, you know, so, you know, I knew there were things there. Our budget has over tripled since since I took over way uh -huh. back then. That's great. And so uh, we've been very, very successful. But it's really, once again, I'll reiterate, because of who we have on the team. Uh, if, if you were to ask me who's the lucky person, it's me because I have a board of directors that is super. They're just wonderful. They're connected. They, they're they smart. Uh, we have a great staff that's the same way. Um, and so so I end up being the lucky guy, okay, in that position. And I really believe that. Good. Well, and you and said, then I have a wife who supports me. So oh, even that's, better. That's, <laughs> that's, that may be. By support, you mean she just is wondering what you're going to do or say next? To some degree. <laughs> that's mine. <laughs> oh, boy. You didn't really say that, did you? Yeah, you know? that's right. You're not going to go out looking like that, that's are you? Yeah. Oh, I get that a lot. <laughs> <I do. laughs> You're wearing that tonight? That's why a jacket or you know, a flight suit or a polo. You, you it, all all it all yeah, works. It all works. Absolutely. Uh, Jim, so, I mean, as far as the background of the museum, people can look up. But what, what's important for us to know about the history of the museum? I'm sure somewhere along the way someone – decided whether it was Balboa Park that was there first, or I, I, what do we need to know about the history? Well, the park has its own history, of, of course. course. You know, we're in the uh, Ford Building, which was built in 35 for the 35-36 exposition. It's a cool building. Mm -hmm. So if you're into history, uh, we've actually done a book on the building, oh, wow. meaning our team. Uh, we have the largest privately held archives and library now in the country. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we have researchers, uh, you know, from all over the world who use the tools that we have at the museum. But um, uh, 
so, you know, it's a round shape. It's, uh, you know, uh, they drove cars in it. They had the International Road of the Americas, you know, kind of thing. And, and they did a lot of stuff. And then they used it for about a year and a half and drove away from it. So, so um, but it's got a, a world famous mural, uh, the March of Transportation, inside that most people very candidly miss. Yeah. Uh, because I think the most interesting thing about the mural uh, historically is when you get to the end of the tour of the museum, you look up, and it was kind of their vision of the future. So it's a little bit Art Deco goes aerodynamic. Oh, wow. And uh, but it's uh, but like I said, I think it's very cool. So uh, you know, as you know, uh, the museum burned down in 1978, and the old electric building in the park. I don't know if I knew that, actually. Yeah, we wow. did. We did. Okay. I wasn't there. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I, have a, uh, I have a standing, it's not going to burn down on my watch. Uh-huh. So the sprinkler systems work. The fire department does routine training in the back of our, okay. you know, in the back parking lot. I go, to, I go and tell them whenever I see them, keep coming here. <laughs> when you stop, I'm going to come looking for you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, so it burned down. Uh, so uh, the resurrection in the Ford building, the Ford building very candidly was a derelict. And so mm-hmm. uh, I would tell you that in a weird sort of way, it was a fortunate uh, fire. Um, uh, certainly not for some of the things they lost sure. uh, because they lost their, their first uh, Spirit of St. Louis. Uh, we, you know, we, uh, we rebuilt the one we have now you know, uh, from the ground up. But T. Claude Ryan you know, himself participated in its construction. It last flew in 2003 on the 75th anniversary of, uh, of Lindbergh Field because I still call it Lindbergh Field. It doesn't have to be called <laughs> San Diego International <laughs> like they want. Well, they're building some new terminals now, so they oh, might I finally know. get their way. Um, you said earlier about how it's a hive of activity and noise and there's spinning blades on the mm-hmm. Cobra yeah. in the pavilion. And, and so, right, we all know that we're here in our studio now, but at one point we thought, boy, let's record there because then we got these amazing backdrops. Right. And the acoustics are not terrific for a podcast, dare I say. Plus, boy, you're about, what, 200 feet below southwest when they're coming overhead? We are. We call that the Balboa Park Pause. <laughs> Airplanes come you know, overhead. You have there. We do. So if someone's speaking and an airplane comes over, it depends on on the loudness of the event. Uh-huh. But, but yes, and they just pause or they keep talking. You know, the, needless to say, the uh, the PA and the you know the sound system works pretty well. Sure. We've been able to uh, conquer that. Mm-hmm. Although the greatest single challenge is it's a round building, so sound uh, just starts going just you know literally yeah. all over. Yeah. And um, but it's a cool building oh, and. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, our restoration department, you know, downstairs, because we have two restoration facilities. We have one at Gillespie Field, as well as the one in the basement of the of the main museum, where we're building right now a Hughes H-1 racer. Uh, you think of the airplane Leo crashed in the movie The Aviator. Uh, we're going to bring the second one in the world uh, back alive, uh, which was a real challenge because there are no plants. You know, the the one in the National Air and Space is the one. And so uh, fortunately, Jack Daly, the uh, the director for, you know, about 20 years was a very good friend. I said, I said, I need pictures and I need rulers and I need <laughs> <laughs> tape measures. I thought you were going to say you need lasers and... Uh... <laughs> well, some of that too. We've had some people help us with certain, uh, you know, elements of sure. it. But, uh, you know, this is the day of, you know, flush rivets, you know, coming along and, you know, all that kind of that kind of cool stuff. Kind and of it's it's yeah. quite because we have several airplanes, the GB and the P-26 that are ground up uh, builds, including actually our Bell X-1 as you walk into the uh, the main rotunda. Yeah. And uh, because, you know, when I give presentations, I talk about, you know, aviation and space and how it really is a perfect overlay to the march or growth of technology worldwide. You know, you think of uh, December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers for 12 seconds and 120 feet on the first flight. Uh, and that was 120 years ago. And, uh, you know, how far have we come? You know, World War One, of course, was huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you've got, uh, you know, uh, big, tall, lanky guy, you know, uh, Lindbergh, who crosses the Atlantic in 33 and a half hours solo when people had died trying because, you know, that airplane was built in San Diego, that Ryan uh, airplane that he flew, the Spirit, uh, because most people don't know where the, you know, how did it get the Spirit of St. Louis? And, of course, it was a competition called the Ortigue Prize 
out of St. Louis, but he chose an aircraft manufacturer here in San Diego. Right. And then, uh, you know, Jaeger breaks the sound barrier, October 1447. Uh, we're walking on the moon in uh, 69, and uh, we're going to go back. That's right. So, so when you look at it, it's really pretty cool to believe, because you were involved and all the people that have been involved, you know, in aviation and space have used those kinds of technologies that we see should be in, uh, you know, Star Trek or right. Star Wars or whatever. So all we got to do is age a little bit more and maybe we'll see some of that stuff. <laughs> maybe so. Well, let's hope. Does the museum itself have a mission, per se, or a mission statement? I mean, It what, does. It know. does. It's probably easiest to look it up because, you know, it's complicated like sure. everything else. But, you know, really, you know, our primary job is to, you know, um, excite, incentivize, um, uh, you know, provide a fun place, uh, an activity. And, and many years ago, I actually stole this statement from uh, a company. <laughs> it's a theme park production company. Okay. Okay. That has like Dollywood. It's the Herschel Corporation. And it's to create memories worth repeating. And, you know, if you, if you simplify it that much, mm -hmm. that's kind of what we're about because we'd like people to come back. We'd like them to leave knowing that they didn't really see it all. Um, I think that, you know, when I first got to the museum, it was about a 30 to 40 minute walk. Uh, now you can spend literally four or five, six hours. You can oh, spend a long time yeah. and you're not going to see it all. No. Uh, and you're not going to experience it all. From, like I said, the 3D, 4D theater to, you know, the Sims to, you know, all the experiences that we can provide. And of course, a tremendous amount of interactivity um, that's, you know, simple, uh, but we also have complicated or yeah. More complicated. Well, let's discuss some of those because I assume you have programs, whether it's for children or maybe we do. just enthusiasts. So we do. We have an education department. Okay. You know, we're a, uh, we're a member of the uh, Price Charities uh, School in the Park program. So we have kids uh, in the museum during the school year uh, every day going to school with us, uh, which is always very exciting. I love to hear kids' voices, and I think it's a tremendous program, yeah. uh, primarily from the City Heights School. So some of the kids that are, you know, underserved or a little bit perhaps more at risk. But it's, you know, it's who we are as a community, and mm -hmm. – and, uh, you know, we have summer camps. We, you know, matter of fact, uh, we just had our staff meeting this morning at 10 o'clock, and uh, our education director said, oh, my God, in the first 10, you know, we had 104 people, sign, you know, and there are more signing up. So they'll go on wait lists, and uh, so I encourage people to, uh, to get in early. Get on our website. We have a really, really good website. You know, do some deep diving. See what the museum offers. We have birthday parties. We have 85 to 90 events there a year uh, high school proms uh, you uh, you would be surprised how many people said you know I had my high school prom there I had my graduate you know whatever it may be so we can be you know something that's important to the community you know the in-town tourists but we can also be something to the out-of-town tourists right. uh, because it's uh, uh, the most common question I ask people when I'm down on the floor is where are you from and then how'd you find us because it's an interesting equation, mm -hmm. really, knowing that so many people get on the web. They get on the Internet and they search, you know, for a good time, you know, whatever it may be, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and they end up at the museum. Well, that's, a, that's not a bad problem to have. No, yeah, it's not. And, uh, and, of course, COVID was pretty brutal. We were closed 266 days. Yeah. We had four reopenings. We're the only museum, okay, in this region that on those four reopenings did reopen. Oh, wow. The only one, each one of the four, and we opened seven days a week. We didn't just open for two days a week or three days a week. Uh, and, and our team, very candidly, is proud of that. Mm. You know, this is a little bit, you as a, another Navy guy, okay, we got to do the next launch. So let's go. All right. Now, some organizations used COVID to sort of regroup and refresh. Did you just turn off the lights and walk out? Or oh, no, 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 no. Guys... We were there. Yeah, absolutely. We didn't, uh, no, we didn't turn off the lights. We were there. Uh, we knew what we had to do. And uh, uh, because some also cleaned house of people. Uh, our goal uh, was to retain 100% of our team members. Because, you know, how do you, how do you just start letting people go mm. At one of the worst times yeah. in the history of our, certainly the worst time in the history yeah. of me, yeah. and uh, uh, we retained them all. We had some natural attrition, meaning people, you know, leaving Here's the job, the retiring, yeah. moving, sure. you know, whatever it may be. But we did not lay off one person, and That's we're good. very proud of that. Good. It's not just employees, though. I assume you have volunteers as well. We do. 
Okay. Yeah, we have a couple hundred volunteers who are with us, uh, you know, all the time because mm-hmm. once again we're a seven day a week organization. You know, we're busiest of course on Saturday, Sunday, sure. and then Friday, and on down the you know the, the quietest day is probably Monday. So if you just want the museum to yourself, <laughs> or you I'd come on a Monday. Come on a Monday or a Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. Now earlier you talked about the two facilities, one in Balboa Park, and then one just up the street from us here at Gillespie Field. Just, we're in the Circle Air Group uh, FBO here. And yep. Part of the reason I thought to reach out to your organization is I would drive by it and say, check it out. they got an F-8 or an F-86 or yep, an H-60 or a big rocket. I'm not quite sure what kind that is. but Oh, it's an Atlas. An Atlas. So great history here in San Diego. Okay. You know, one of our plans is to, you know, possibly move it down to uh, Balboa Park. That, that Atlas? Mm-hmm. Okay. So what happens out here? And are people able to come to Glasgow? They are. They are. Okay. They can go uh, there. I think we're only closed uh, one day a week, one or two days. So get online and check. And yeah, your, but it's online, okay. and uh, it's a nominal fee, uh, but it's a great facility. Uh, we have, as you described, a number of airplanes. Um, you know, one of the ones we acquired most recently was uh, Baron Hilton's Staggerwing. So if you're a, an aviation aficionado and you want to see, I think, one of the most beautiful airplanes of all time, you're going to see his Staggerwing with Baron's name on it. Uh, funny story, we inducted Baron into the Hall of Fame, and I was up in the Beverly Hilton in his office. Uh, he was a heavy cigar smoker. I thought I was smoking a cigar, and I wasn't. <laughs> but it was, uh, uh, but just such a gentleman. And uh, we're going through this and talking about the evening and you know what he could expect and and you know his concerns or you know how. You know, and of course, it's going to go very well with him. And uh, uh, but he turns to me all of a sudden. He goes, uh, Jim, can you think of any reason why I shouldn't give you my stagger wing when I pass away? Well, I didn't come up there to ask for the stagger wing, but now the Baron Hilton has just said this to me. And um, uh, I said, you know, Baron, I'm going to flunk that test. I can't think of any reason <laughs> why. And within well, two well, weeks, the paperwork was done, and we have the airplane well, you know, here at Gillespie. And it, yeah. uh, once again, it's a beauty. Besides all the other airplanes that we have there, the, the P-2. and I want to ask you about some of them because okay. I'm guessing I'm the only one when I walk up to your front door at Balboa who thinks, oh, look, it's an SR-71. <laughs> right. It's an A-12, of course. A-12. It's the first version, yeah. you know. Yeah, single and, seat. Uh, single seat yeah. and um, heck of an airplane. I mean, just, you know, um, you know, uh, what do you say about the Blackbird? I, I mean, yeah. it's just magic. Uh, if you've ever, did you ever get a chance to land at Beale when they were flying? No, I never, oh, oh. Wait, or did I? I think I might have gone there once in an F-16, but I was a student. Right. And so I was just focused on not well, screwing up. Well, <laughs> uh, believe it or not, I had to divert there because of fog in the valley one time. Oh, gosh, yeah. So I land without a DD-175 flight plan. Uh-oh. Well, you would have thought I was, you know. Invading. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, there yeah. are dogs and guns oh, yeah. and all this kind yeah. of stuff. And, um, um, uh, and of course, as you know, they leak like a sieve on the ground. But, yeah. uh, uh, but you know, just like I said, what an airplane. And, um, and was that one a flyer? I mean, so oh, sure. some of these you're recreating or. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. Are all it's, these. It's the real deal. Everything in the museum? The majority. Yeah. Okay. yeah. There's right. only, there's only a couple, you know, um, like a mock-up, maybe you would call it, or what would you call well, it? Well, uh, okay, so when we built the P-26, the P-Shooter, okay, mm-hmm. which is kind of an in-between, you know, uh, World War One, World War Two airplane, all-metal construction, still fixed gear, open cockpit, round engine, okay, but um, it's immaculate, meaning inside, outside, in the wind. I'll go by the uh, restoration team members. You know, you could just kind of maybe one rib, skip two, do another rib. You know, you're, you're going to cover these, right? <laughs> I'm joking when I say that to them because they look at me like, what are you talking about, Jim? So we don't build anything that isn't totally accurate and could fly. Even on the inside where you won't, well, most of the visitors won't see it. Yep, even on the inside. So that GB, okay, you got to remember the GB is an early 30s airplane. So... When the GB was flying, Bonnie and Clyde were doing their thing. So, yeah. so we actually, um, uh, when we built it, uh, because you know this is an airplane that's a big engine with the little wings, uh, tended to uh, want to uncouple itself and you know flip over, fly the wrong way, exactly, <laughs> yeah. and swap ends. So, so, but 
But, you know, Doolittle flies one in September uh, 32 to 296 miles per hour, the world speed record, when military airplanes, most were struggling to get over 200. Mm. Remember, this is, you know, like I said, the early 30s, and speed was, you know, was everything. And um, uh, so if you look at it inside the cockpit, it is just magnificent, the workmanship, the wings, uh, because, you know, there's an airplane that's uh, metal, Mm-hmm. wood and fabric you know typical Great. you know of the day yeah. and uh, uh and just the, like i said the workmanship is just and a handful to fly i it's heard be- so oh yeah well yeah. to see just a taxi oh yeah i mean you look at that thing <laughs> and you know the granville brothers uh when we got the plans to that one the only thing we had to agree to uh is not to put a uh well not to fly it so we just left one thing out of it and that was a fuel tank because we weren't going to you know, put any fuel in sure. it. Sure. So. Interesting. All right. But that was the deal to get the plants. Okay. So when you walk in past my SR-71 A12, you go into, I think, the rotunda first, and then in the pavilion. Now, we had Willie D on the show talking mm-hmm. about his five shoot downs, but we have, what, an F4 chasing a MiG-17. So we do. tell me about that. We do. Well, you know, it's iconic. Yeah. Okay, because if you look at uh, Vietnam, and you think of the air war in Vietnam, mm-hmm. okay, it's the MiG-17 and the F4. Phantom, mm-hmm. uh, because the MiG-17 shot down more than anything else, you know, you know, followed by the 21. But uh, 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 because, um, uh, and of course, we did place the F-4 in the right little, you know, spot behind the <laughs> MiG-17. But um, but you know, we've got um, you know Willie's name on it. Willie's a great guy. You know, he's uh, he's as good at the job and the presentation of of. Top Gun and the Top Gun discipline, as I think anybody gives. He has decades of experience. Not to take away from it, but he's been doing it a long time. That's so exactly. I would that's... hope in 40 years I'm good at this podcasting thing finally, Jim. Well, I think you seem to be doing okay. <laughs> well, I haven't asked long enough questions yet to allow you to get a drink. So if you need to do that, we can yeah. always edit out later. But Okay. Well, anyway. I'm okay. The um... <laughs> Well... You can't talk and drink, so let me uh, let me ask okay. you about the Blue Angel in there. You've yeah. got an F-18, which I loved seeing because I flew the F-18 mainly, yep. Yep. and it's painted in Blue Angel colors. So my question here is, is it a Blue Angel? Or if you have an F-18 in the museum, let's paint it like a Blue Angel because the kids will like that more. No, it's a Blue Angel Hornet. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, it was a, um, a project that I worked with Boeing. All right. uh, we identified it. It actually came out of Florida. Uh, so it flew with the blues, uh, but what, ha- what what we needed to do when it got to us is we needed to give it a paint job. So it went up to Leading Edge up in Victorville, mm. okay, that does a lot of the painting for uh, Boeing, and of course they took it on as a pet project. And they, did, you know, were glad to do this for Boeing and for the museum. So they came down, you know, when we brought the airplane, uh, you know, in, and um, you know, we've got you know a brand new uh, Blue Angel helmet on the mannequin, and it looks really good, you know, yeah. uh, and so we've got you know all the right stuff. So it it has the pedigree, you know, of the, of the Blues and certainly of the Hornet, and so we're. It and and it's it's really the best looking one you'll ever see because I went to the blues so I you know like all of us who know people I said I need decals I need inlet you know intake covers I need you know tail I need everything yeah, yeah. and they said it that's so. good now was that flown out here or did you fly it to Victorville no 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 it, it was trucks? already it was already out of the uh, Blue Angel fleet okay. uh, it had come out of uh, I'm not sure if it was it may have been at Jacksonville. Okay. okay. Yeah. And so um, so we hauled it out and okay. Boeing, you know, Boeing brought it to us and, uh, you know, we're very proud of, of how it looks. How about the uh, P-51 in there? What's the story with it? Well, um, you know, we have it in the uh, Tuskegee Airmen Red Tail, mm-hmm. uh, you know, colors. Uh, Squadron Colors. Um, I think probably the coolest thing about the airplane, something that most people won't ever see, is what we inducted the Tuskegee Airmen into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame. And so when we do an organization, a group, a team, you know, whatever it may be, okay. we usually bring two people to represent them. We brought uh, uh, two, uh, Lee Archer and Roscoe Brown, uh, two of the finest gentlemen I've ever met in my life. But I'm back with the airplane, and we're walking around, and I said, come here to both of them and i happened to have a gold um, you know sharpie, sharpie. on me I okay was so i had them both sign the tail of the Very airplane cool. and just knowing that it's there permanently cuz they both have passed away oh. and uh, but they uh, they represented the the airmen 
as well as anybody I've ever seen represent another Fantastic. organization. Yeah, There is a gentleman who flies for my airline who I flew with once, and uh, he is a son of a Tuskegee Airman yeah. who flies a P-51 yep. at air shows. And well, the P-51, so. let's not kid ourselves, is one of the sexiest oh, airplanes yes. you know, of World War II. If you just said, you know, okay. Maybe ever. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, which airplane do you want to <laughs> yeah. go fly? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's like, um, oh, God, I'm trying to think of Bud Anderson's airplane. You know, Bud had 16 and a quarter kills. Old Crow. Old Crow, You know, yeah, so yeah. you'll go to, uh, you know, Air Venture, you know, and you'll see eight of them <laughs> because it's such a popular, right. you know, yeah. you know, paint well, job. Speaking of sexy airplanes, did you end up with the S3 Viking that uh, President Bush flew in? Was, is it, was that here or where did that end up? Do you know? We have it. You have it. Yeah. Is it on It display? went to NASA. Okay. So it's out, of, it's out of Gillespie. Okay. So it did fly in. Okay. Uh, it must be about a year and a half ago. Um but, you know, the engines are still in it. They did something to, so we couldn't start it. But I always said, you know, I, I've said for years, you know, a pilot's biggest single fear is how do I start it? You know, if you get it started, you know, we can play with the trim on takeoff roll or, you know, <laughs> we'll figure it out. They landed and poured something down the fuel tank. Too, exactly. Right? exactly. From, they heard and, about you. Yeah. So, oh, um, so we've got that here. Uh, uh, what was surprising about that airplane, of course, is that we needed them to fold the wings. They'd been flying it straight winged, uh-huh. uh, meaning they weren't folding it, you know, for a couple of years. So it was a big event just to see the wings fold as they uh, uh-huh. as they brought it in. And it's sitting near the P two V, you know, which uh, you know is the. Uh, uh, probably the Navy's uh, last version of a World War II looking like airplane right. uh, that was a firefighter modified. And yeah. We had an episode on aerial firefighting. I'm kind of disappointed, Jim. You didn't uh, flinch when I called the S3 sexy. Well, um, <laughs> with all due respect, I have a my... lot of friends who yeah, flew I them, too. so I. <laughs> I'd have to defend myself, you know. Well, because you, okay, you know, it was affectionately called the Hoover because how it sounded on the ball, you know, just, you know. And, um, but, you know, having flown with it on cruise, okay, it was a uh, phenomenal uh, tanker, okay, Mm -hmm. so it did that role extremely well. Um, I'm not totally sure why they took the ASW mission off the uh, off the fleet carriers, but they did. And, uh, and that's really because, you know, we have subs out there and, and you know yeah. other other stuff yeah so well at the top i mentioned uh, viewers can go to movies if they want more military aviation one of those was devotion you have an f4u corsair is that a hot spot for uh, viewers these days are they coming by to see that one i don't think necessarily to see that airplane i think that they recognize it more sure you know what it is okay um uh, you know uh the original corsair is you know it probably matches the p51 in its sexiness, uh, you know, as an airplane and how it looks, uh, you know why the gull wing, right? It had to do with the uh, getting the landing gear strong enough, didn't it? Uh uh-uh. Size of the prop. Size of the prop. So they I just know they just bent the wing. Okay. Took the prop up higher, and now you got a gull wing design because it's the only gull wing design there is. Mm. Now that airplane came to us. That is probably one of the finest restoration projects. Mm that our team ever took on. It came out of uh, Texas. Uh, it had been in Katrina, um, wow. a significant amount of damage, and uh, and candidly, the, there was poor workmanship in its prior restoration. So our team took to it. We put Jerry Coleman's, you know, so that's in marine markings. Uh, Jerry Coleman, of course, the, uh, uh, the ex-padre uh, coach for a year and uh, an announcer, and uh, he played for the Yankees and was actually the, the MVP uh, you know, in the World Series. Right? I asked him, I said, because uh, uh, Jerry was, you know, was just, he was just really a great guy. I said, okay, what's the deal? MVP, okay? He goes, it seemed like every time I got up, there was somebody on base, I hit him in. And so, <laughs> you know, so, so you know, it's the better, runs batted in kind of thing. Better lucky and, than good, right? Well, ab- uh, absolutely. It sounds like you had both. Well, and uh-huh. we inducted uh, Jerry into the Hall of Fame. Oh, good. He was the only Major League Baseball player in the history of the sport to fly combat in two wars. Wow. You made me think of something, I don't know why, but there are, for example, F4Us still flying, there are P-51s still flying, there's a handful of warbirds still flying. Does anyone ever, I'm sure you shut them down, but does anyone ever reach out to you and say, I'm really needing this part right now, can you help me? A few times. (laughs) Really? (laughs) What's the answer, no? Well, if, if it was a trade part for part, meaning ours worked, theirs didn't, ah. but it would fit in and and you wouldn't know it. Mm-hmm. You know, we would, 
we would consider right. that. We've had that happen a couple times. All right. You know, because once again, you're out there looking for for stuff. You know, uh, you know, we have a beautiful Spitfire. Uh, probably one of the most significant airplanes, believe it or not, is a Japanese Zero. Yeah. You just don't see a lot of Jap Zeros, Japanese Zeros, you know. <laughs> All, Remember, I'm the kid of a of a uh, of the greatest generation. So, you know, when you're born in 1949, you know, you grew up with parents who fought in the war. Sure, sure. Of all the aircraft in there, what's your favorite? Ah, boy, today. Well, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a real fan of the A4 Skyhawk. Uh, okay, it was just one fun airplane to fly. Okay, you know, uh, it's got a roll rate that certainly beats the Hornet. You know, the F-14 or whatever, you know, uh, you know, 720 degrees per second max deflection roll rate is fun. You know, if you just pull it in the vertical and you do, you know, six, seven or eight of them, yeah. it's, you know. And so, um, so like I said, it was very fun. Yeah. I was a small guy, uh, fit very well at that time. And uh, um, so, like I said, very, very much fun to fly, fun to fly, a lot of ACM in it. You know, yeah. uh, you know, very fortunate to fly on a million Top Gun missions. You know, with 126, yeah. uh, because you know you need all the uh, the adversary absolutely. you know assets yeah. you can get. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, fights on at the merge, and there uh, and there was nothing better than to be in a being an A4. Yeah. You know, we had an A4 episode as well. A couple of weeks ago, we released a video of me explaining all the patches on my side of the wall. Yeah. Here. And if you look over my shoulder, you'll see VT7 and the A4. And at one point, I showed people the Skyhawks Forever patch over here. And I told them, I said, I never felt comfortable wearing that because with 110-ish hours as a student, it was different than someone like you who flew quite a bit right. and did missions in it. So I, I love the patch because uh, of the colors on it. You can see it over there. Well, but, like I said, over 1,800 hours in the airplane, yeah. you start to feel you know, that you know it a little bit, you know. And yeah. uh, uh, VT-7, of course, was a squadron that when I was at Sinatra, Chief Naval Air Training Staff, mm -hmm. you know, I would go down and fly with their instructors and their students. And, you know, it was really important and just to kind of uh, maybe add this to, uh, the, to the conversation. We don't need to talk about it anymore. But the importance of ensuring that where when we pin the wings of gold on at some squadron in Meridian, Mississippi, or Beeville at the time, right. Kingsville at the time, that they're the same wings. When they yeah. show up in the fleet, it's absolutely critical that they uh, they have that same level of high-performance training. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the A4 as well. Well, and then I, well, then yeah. I got to do the Blue Angel NATOP check ride. You did? Yeah. You went, so, you went up in the back seat? Yeah. So, oh, uh, wow. you know, I had, uh, I think it was... Uh, uh, the Marine rep at the time, nice. uh, we were doing a command inspection because they worked for Sinatra, okay, and I had to give the NATOPS check ride, and uh, I said, I remember at the end, I said, now, do you really think I'm going to give a down to a blue angel? <laughs> do you re do I look that stupid? <laughs> yeah. Jim, some of the aircraft in the museum, at least in the Balboa facility, are pretty big. Yep. I, I mean, so is it like a when you go to a car dealership and you wonder how they got the big truck on the showroom floor? I mean, are there big doors that open or do you there have are. cranes? There or? are. On two okay. sides of the museum. Uh, the Hornet was a classic example. You know, that's not a small airplane. No. You know, when, uh, you know, when the Hornet replaced the Corsair, the Corsair II, the A7, you know, all of a sudden the footprint on the flight deck became just a little more crowded. And uh, so, uh, we, you know, we've got big doors. The airplane gets real skinny without wings and... Uh, right. Uh, and of course, you know we're you know okay, so we're a port in place concrete building, so we have a lot of strength to us, mm. and um, uh, that's been verified by a lot of the uh, uh, the architects, you know that that work on historic structures because this is not a new building, and uh, so uh, you know we have you know ones that are hanging, and but we've had them all checked to make sure that they're safe because you know even in San Diego we get a, you know occasionally a little yeah. and all of a sudden you'll look out and, well there's one that's kind of moving a little you know swaying a bit right oh boy all right so in 2019 there was an article about something like an F14 has appeared on a carrier flight deck for the first time in over 10 years and I believe the San Diego Air and Space Museum had a role in that so tell Take it from the beginning. Right? Well, a uh, good friend of mine, uh, uh, Greg Keithley, you know, uh, yep, Chaser, Chaser. Oh, yeah. you know, at uh, at uh, Hook, uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, providing them some, uh, uh, you know, consultation. Yeah, he was involved. You know, on the on the whole movie process, uh, and he's a great guy and a great friend. And mm -hmm. he uh, said, well, you know, my buddy Jim's got one, you know, so why don't you call Slug and uh, 
and they did, and we worked out a you know deal, and it was gone for about five months. You know, came back to us, and um, uh, so uh, and this is probably I'm going to give you a little bit of a sneak preview on something we're working on. Okay, is our plan is to take the seat art off of the front of it's the next museum, next to the A12 there, correct, mm-hmm. and put up our Tomcat. Really? Yep. Okay. And so that's a project we're working on right now, working with the Tomcat Association, their group, you know, on, on that and some other stuff associated with it. Nice. And uh, so we think that'll be a great project. You know, you think of, um, remember, I'm back, uh, you know, in 126 at Miramar about the time that the F-14 is really just getting going over in 124. And um, uh, so it's, I, I think it's very exciting. And to realize the VF-1 and 2, you know, left Miramar on Enterprise, you know, on that first cruise. So we just got to figure out what, how we're going to paint it and whose name's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably some politics around oh, that my goodness. here in San Diego. Fortunately, I know who gets to make the final decision. Ah, very good. So that's okay. good. So at some point, uh, right, meetings, emails, whatever, as far as we, can we borrow this thing? And you don't have to talk about any if there's compensation or not. But so they whisk it away to make it look the way they want it to look for the movie. They do. And then, I mean, but how, this is like an F-18, the one I saw with my name on it, they just pull the wings off and off it goes on the bed of a truck. Can an F-14 go down the highway? Kind of, okay. <laughs> right. uh, because as you know, the swing wing, okay, a little bit of it. That's right. right. That's right. Over they can fold, swing. but they had to, you know, they got to take wings off and that kind hmm. of stuff. Uh, because, you know, later on, that became part of the, the Tomcats challenge, okay, as the swing wing starts to starts to wear out in a weird sort of way. Right. And so, um, uh, you know, they did whatever it took, um, you know, and uh, uh, they compensated us for uh, the scarring that did occur that had to be fixed. Okay. But, uh, you know, it was certainly worthy of participation in the movie. You know, the movie, uh, you know, you know, we all look at it as as naval aviators, and we go, you know, five percent real, ninety <laughs> percent, you know, you know, whatever it may be. These are great flying movies, oh, yeah. and they and they, you know, they they generate a lot of excitement, you know, for everyone who gets to watch them. Sure. And um, uh, I I I think when you go back and you realize, so what were you doing in 1980? <laughs> <laughs> you know, seeing it for the first time, we didn't expect there to be a second one. Okay, so just the fact that they had a second one and that it was uh, very successful is it really was, yeah. a credit to an awful lot of people. Oh, yeah, so. indeed. I had some of them on this show, actually. I was proud to do that. Good. And the movie itself helped put us a little bit on the map because there was an excitement around sure. military aviation. So sure. people found us, which was great. Sure. Now, so again, if even if you pull the wings off an F-14, it's still pretty big. So are these getting on special trucks and maybe moving at three in the morning kind of thing? Yep. Okay. And then as far as putting it on the carrier, I mean, those big cranes that are there anyway. Oh, yeah. That, that's that's the easy part, standard. really. Okay. Because they've all got, you know, uh, uh, lifting points. Sure. You know, so th- that's the easiest part of it. You know, years ago, I uh, I was the event manager. When I was at Air Force's staff, I was the event manager for the Jimmy Doolittle Raid reenactment. Okay, back in 1992. Wow. And, you know, uh, I always thought that was the biggest single challenge. You know, we qualified four airplanes on the runway, you know, you know, in short takeoff, uh, uh, you know, uh, procedures, trim settings, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and then, you know, qualified four, that if we got two up, we'd crane them both aboard to make sure one could fly off. If they were both up, we'd launch them both, which we did. But, you know, my biggest fear was, we drop one, yeah. and so uh, they had four points, and they lifted them up because you know these aren't new airplanes, All right. and so we had in the mood and heavenly body, you know, uh, two B twenty fives, you know, replicate the launch first time since uh, World War Two. Very cool, yeah, uh, excellent. And That's you, that event thing. Remember, you, I see a theme here. When you got the F-14 back, was it back the way you wanted it? Or yeah, okay. yeah, no, no, no. They took care of as much as they could. There's going to be you know little. You know, love kisses. You know, if sure. if you will, but uh, but they didn't put it like on its nose, like the way the movie depicted it after no, it come to a barricade. No, 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 yeah, no. Sure, okay. No, it didn't get any. Of that. There's a lot of CGI. Right. You know, I was about to say. Obviously, you and I know it didn't fly. That's correct. Uh, that's but they correct. did fly, as that's we correct. heard from. And they didn't rip the gear off. You know, when, ah, yeah, you true. Know. <laughs> yeah. And they might have gently draped a, uh, a barricade netting over it to right. uh, to film. Right. Okay. So so like I said, we're very excited about uh, about putting this on a stick. 
you know, in front of the museum. We think it'll be very yeah. iconic for San Diego, all of it, military aviation history. Uh, you know, the Tomcat will will resonate with everybody, oh, gosh, yes. whether they flew it or not. Uh, Universally uh, you know, loved. Yeah, I actually went through their three week long ground school course because I was. You know, sitting there going, okay, what's going to happen? So I wanted to, I went to Sear School, you know, checking as many boxes as Before I Before you could. went off to A7s? Right. Okay. Right. Now, you said put it on a stick and just, you know, I don't know, curious detail. Generally on the aircraft out front, you typically like to raise them up so people don't bonk their heads? I mean, we will for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but inside, right? I mean, how do you remind people to be careful? Well, um, it's very they packed inside. They, they don't seem to bump their heads. Oh, that's good. Okay. Which is good. Here's what I tell people, because we're a little bit different than National Air and Space. Uh, you know, they get real edgy of, oh, you can't touch that, can't touch this. All right. If somebody, some little 12-year-old or 8-year-old, kicked one of those airplanes, we can fix it. I know it sounds corny. But probably better than getting on them and they have a negative experience, Oh, right? no. They'll no, never I'm... get. They'll never be able to get on them. No, and, I don't mean, right, yeah. I, that's not what I meant. Yeah. Uh, getting mad at the child and, and creating right. absolutely. an experience where oh, they now absolutely. associate military aviations with pain. Yeah, so you want we, them to have a good time. And that's Doesn't right. So we can fix it. Everything. So, uh, you know, if somebody reaches out and touches the end of the wing just to feel what it's like, that's kind of okay. We can wipe you know, off. There's nothing we can't oils. wipe off, clean off, paint, <laughs> you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Because I think that's an important element, you know, because, you know, when you're a kid, you kind of, you know, there's kind of a touchy-feely part of all of us. You know, what does that feel like, right. you know? and. You know, what kind of an edge is that? So uh, we can I, we can offer that. I sometimes wish I hadn't lost that wonder. You know, kids have, I think, the right way of looking at things, and the rest of us just get too much scarring or baggage or something along the way. But anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. What's the future for the museum? Oh, sorry, the Adventure Center. See, I like it. It sounds cool, doesn't it? Yeah, I like it. Well, I think that, um, okay, so if I had it my way, you know, we'd add about 80,000 square feet onto the museum right there in Balboa Park. And I have some uh, some rough schematics. Really? You know, showing that. Okay. Because there's so much more. Here's, here's the challenge when you're a museum that has historic representations. Today is tomorrow's history. So if you're there to connect the dots, okay, show them, you know, you know that progression, but you're also there to give them a vision of the future. Because with young people, those, what I affectionately call the next greatest generations, I think what, what drives us, especially the children of the greatest generation, is a belief that there will be future greatest generations because that's the message they left us. You know, uh, my dad was one of those who, uh, you know, headed off to war at age 17, had to get his mother's permission to quit school, okay, with the promise that he would go back to school when the war was over. That's how my parents met. She's two years younger than he is. So he goes off, finishes the war, because remember, his brothers are already there, et cetera. And, and, and those... Um, those stories impacted us, I think, in a very positive way that we all believed, okay, in mm. this country. Uh, you know, there's, um, there's patriots and there are people who aren't patriots. Uh, I prefer hanging around with patriots, yeah. people who believe in, you know, who and what we are as a nation. Uh, because if we're going to have a strong future, your three sons, my three sons, you know, all of our kids that are out there— we do this for a reason. You know, anybody who, who chose to wear the uniform said, I'm willing to give it all, okay, for the future of them. Yeah. That's just the way it is. And we don't think about it. It's not like we say, oh, you know, what if I'm going to die on this flight? I mean, I, you know, sooner or later you don't get in the cockpit if you think that way. Right. And so uh, the people I've met over the years and uh, been able to call friends, you know, my best friend in the Navy was a guy named Phil Mills, um, you know, Philo. Uh, everywhere we went in our first fleet squadron on debt to Fallon on the ship, you know, we roomed together, and um, you know we got to know each other pretty well. His wife always said, "Ed said you grew up together," and uh, there's a lot of truth to yeah. that. As you go back to the room and you tell, you know, a buddy how you almost killed yourself that night, right? And um, on board. <laughs> uh, and you know, I pay him the biggest compliment I can pay any other Navy pilot I've ever known, and that's that he flies like me. Now. 
judgmentally, that may not be good, okay? <laughs> but he flies like me, and it all makes sense. Mm. So if ever we went flying together, uh, we'd get back and we'd debrief and go, well, it looked okay from my standpoint, you know? It didn't have much to say. Yeah, It's kind of corny, but it's... No, it's good. But it's true. It's good. And it's a refreshing perspective you offer on the next generation, because if you believe media and news and everything else, it's all ugliness and bad yep. and this and that... And I personally believe you find what you look for. If you look yep. for beauty in this world, you'll find it. If you look for ugliness, it's plenty of it. You'll find it. And so it's good to know that people like you, Jim, are in positions like you are at the San Diego Air and Space Museum to keep that legacy alive, but also to avail it to that next generation that hopefully a young girl or boy will show up and say, this is what I want to do. I mean, happens a lot at air shows. That's where it happened for me. I hope it happens there as well, because there's a lot of amazing stuff in there, and you just never know what kind of spark you can trigger for someone. No, you don't, and uh, uh, you'll get a kick out of this. So uh, uh, when I was uh, an instructor at VT21 in uh, Kingsville, one of my students was a guy named Greg Dissart. I don't know if you know the name. I think Call I do, actually. Call sign Hollywood. Okay, so okay. So Greg that's, he happened to be a Top Gun during the filming there of the first That's movie. where I've seen it. And so, uh, so Greg, um, we've always been good friends. And I was fortunate. I got a great student. He says he has a great instructor, but let me tell you, you know, <laughs> when you have a great student, it's always, you know, easy to be a good instructor. And, um, you know, and he was uh, a few months ago talking about, you know, one of his sons had just been picked up for flight training and just the joy of all of that. And the realization that your kids are going to do what your kids do, right. whatever they do, you just want to be there to support them, okay? But being patriotic, okay, and appreciative of the freedom that we have in this country. Once again, no matter what you do, not everybody's going to, you know, go in the military, right. uh, but um, uh, but that everything we do counts as people, as human beings. One of my pet peeves is the is the word individuals. So you'll never hear me use, there were three individuals seen running from the fire, okay? Because I think it depersonalizes mm -hmm. who we are as people, mm -hmm. you know? And you would never say, look at the aircraft. You'd say, look at the F-14 Tomcat, you know? And just being more descriptive. So it's very, I have all these corny things, but as you get older, you uh, sure. you become a little more corny. Well, that's okay. I think it's almost expected. So we asked about the future of the museum. What about the future of Jim? That's really a great question because I'm not uh, 16 anymore. Um, but I have no pressure to uh, to leave. I have, as I said, a wonderful board of directors. Matter of fact, we have a board meeting tomorrow. We'll wrap and, up soon, and you and, can no, go I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> and uh, so we have... Uh, 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 because it, you you just start thinking naturally of you know what's going to happen as mm -hmm. uh, uh, as uh, you know I tell people you know sometimes we're in our own car and we're driving along talking to ourselves right we have that conversation just nobody else around except it's us. like singing in the shower it, that's exactly <laughs> that's right <laughs> it, hopefully it wouldn't be that bad for me and so uh, so every so often you realize that you're closer to a hundred than you are to zero. Okay, and it's the realization of what do you want to do? You know, have you ensured that your wife has gotten all those things that right. she should get, you know, uh, being, uh, you know, your partner, which, you know, being the partner of somebody like me has to be pretty rugged, okay, just from the standpoint of, um, you know, working and time away and just doing doing things. Because I, um, I still haven't stopped thinking about, things I want to do. Mm. And when I say I want to do, it's really a we, our, us. It's, sure. it, you know, develop a team. You know, I've I said, you know, well, why not just get, you know, five, six or 10 of your buddies and form a business. And the business is whatever we want to do. You know, <laughs> I mean, right. it's, it's, and what we're good at. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But sometimes you may be good at something, but you finally say, I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. Even though you do it well. Yeah. So, so I don't know. Uh, my executive committee, and this is a very candid uh, thing, give us two years' notice, will you? And, you know, uh, you know, how many times that's, does somebody – two years, yeah. that's a long time. If that's what they told you? <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> okay. And so I said, we can work that. All right. Well, Jim, you've been a lot of fun. You have a lot of single-engine – fighter time ice or, or attack so i have to ask you this sorry do your takeoffs equal your landings yes really that's impressive yep 
Uh, fortunately, they do. Well, because, you know, the old joke was we took off with the emergency. You know, anybody fire, who, low on fuel. Exactly. And <laughs> so anybody who flew with two engines, okay, when they went single engine, they declared an emergency. That's right. Okay, well, were we supposed to declare an emergency <laughs> in an A4 or an A7 when you took off? Uh, I'm an emergency. I'm single engine, you know. Low on fuel. Exactly. <laughs> and um, uh. fortunately, the A7, okay, had uh, had had good reach to it. Uh, the A4 a little bit less, and uh, but uh, but like I said, both good airplanes. And you don't think about it, you know. You don't just um, because you know the 35 comes along and how many engines they put in it, okay? And you know you know the controversy of well, do we do another single engine airplane? But if you look back at you know at the stats and the data, uh, the frequency of a single engine, if you got a good engine, which they should have by now. Uh, you know, we've had help. we've had some bad engines in the past, yeah. Yeah. and um, you know they should have re-engined the A7. Uh, you know, in my personal, you know the the uh, TF41, uh, they should have. You know, yeah. Pratt and Whitney offered them an engine; they should have taken it. I was about 20 years of service, mostly F-18s up to that point when mm-hmm. I finally had a chance to go fly the F-16. And I thought about it a lot, actually, because <laughs> that was just the community was, right. you've got two engines, and if you lose one, it's an emergency. Right. And we'd go out, and of course, it sort of was self-perpetuating because we'd go out and practice those, what do we call them? But, you know, when you're like, oh, my engine has a problem. If I can make it to high key, I can swirl down. Or, oh, P- it's... PPAs. PPA. Practice, precautionary pro- right. approaches. approaches oh, no, we did them in the A7. SFO, and the a- I think we also call it simulated yeah. flame-out approach. Right. That would be an SFA. Well, anyway. well, you know, we just, yeah. in both airplanes, we just set the power to 80%, okay? Crack and, a board, maybe? Um, Not in the A7. Didn't in the A7, because, yeah. you know, once you drop the gear and flaps the board, that was the main problem, that was the challenge in landing the airplane, is that you wanted one more high-drag device out on the ball. Okay, because you remember you're 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 back on the power a little mm-hmm. further than you wanted to be. So we used to say you're working the axle decel cycles of the engine. You know you've moved the throttle; it's not going to be there in a second. You're going to move it back up. You got to think and about it. And so you didn't you didn't it didn't bother you to fly a slightly slow turn in the VFR pattern. And uh, I was very fortunate that I landed well, and I won the rag rag oh, award, and the the bottle, and the training command from the LSOs, and and so that helped that you know that you focused on that because. So we went down to the Lex, you know, the first time Lexington in the Lexington Carrier, yeah, Lexington, mm-hmm. and we didn't use the HUD. They so don't use it, really? and because you don't know if you're going to get it, because if you do a startup on deck, they have no sense. So you're not going to be able to, you, you'll have to go out and fly for 10 or 15 minutes to somehow get the platform to get the The sends is the little signal, right, from the Ships carrier. Ships inertial navigation system so. feeds the airplane. So that your heads-up display will be accurate in the middle of the ocean. Well, and that you'll get a platform. Meaning the stable mm-hmm. gyro mm-hmm. effect. And okay. that's what's ultimately going to yeah. give you the HUD. And so, um, um, uh, so it, yeah, I just, I didn't think that much about it. You know, we all have had stuff. But, you know, both airplanes, you know, is basically setting the power at about 80%. Uh, the A7 was flying like, you know, 190 to 200, 210, you know, with the PPA. It was actually fun to do, mm-hmm. okay, because, you know, you're it's kind like of puzzle, flying through challenge. hoops. Well, yeah. it's like landing the shuttle, you know, right. weird sort of way. Yeah, yeah. Because you're not touching the power till well, they, they didn't have any power. But <laughs> uh, but you don't touch it till you're, yeah. till you're going to touch down. And the A4... Um, it was kind of funny. I don't know where it changed along the way. We used to fly 180 to 200, then it went to 160 to 180. I don't know who changed that. Um, uh, but um, but it was f- fun to fly, you know, the close beam ones and, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, just, you know, it's a challenge to make sure that you sure. shut it down, you know, touch down in the right spot. Or, right. Get it right, because someday if it happens, you want to have that practice. So. Well, that's right. <laughs> and uh, and when you're flying single engine, um, you know, there are all times that we, you know, saw something fluctuating going, oh, yeah. Okay, knock it off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm going home. Yeah. All so. right. How many traps did you end up with? About 310. Okay. Yeah. So I, um, uh, you know, in the old days, uh, the decks were not going out as often sometimes. Yeah. Right. You yeah. Know? Well, and you spent some time on uh, staffs, it sounds like, but you were still flying a lot on the staff, so that's I did. good. Yeah. All right. Well, Jim Kidrick, call sign Slug. Uh, we always end with call sign stories, and uh, I-, I could ask you, I suppose, to stand up for the cameras, but. Uh, maybe... Well, I'm 6'4. I walk short. You walk short? Yeah. I've heard of that one. That's... And uh, <laughs> it's. Um... 
<laughs> well, you know, we all get our call signs in weird ways. I was hoping like wild man or, you know, something like that. We're all, you know, something just a little bit more macho. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, being a young ensign, uh, someone I thought was, uh, you know, some elder lieutenant commander says, hey, you short little ugly guy, slug. And next thing you know, that's what I was. <laughs> Well, better than the slough that you flew, wasn't that what they called well, the A7? Well, they did some. But, you know, it's. I have to make a comment about the Corsair. It was... Corsair 2? Corsair 2. All right. The technology in the airplane was wonderful, mm. okay? Um, we could have all used a little bigger engine, but, you know, it was the first airplane that they put Sidewinders on, the M61 Gatling gun, an array of air-to-ground ordnance, you oh, know, yeah. from Rockeye to APAM to uh, um, LGBs to, uh, uh, what am I thinking of, the, uh, walleye. the video guy, Did the Walleye, that, yeah. Walleye 2, the, you know, the ERDL version. Uh, you know, it was pretty cool at that time to realize that you and I could go out together. I'm going to fly into the target, drop, turn away, and you're going to steer it into the target. And... Um, uh, because you know the LGB and the and the Walleye series were tremendously successful, uh, and uh, you know you weren't going to miss if you got a, a good laze on it. You were going to that bomb's going to hit, and then you know you could drive. You know there are some stories of you know uh, uh, especially Walleyes that had gone in the window, okay, blew up the building inside, but the building was still standing, and they were going, you know what happened? <laughs> but it had. It had it had worked. So yeah. so it was from that standpoint, it was a pretty great airplane, and the HUD was everything you would ever want a HUD to be. Uh, most of us, by the way, flew it decluttered. Okay, you know we just get rid of some of the symbology. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but um, but you know uh, it. Lee Cargill wrote a book. Okay, I forget the title of the book, but it's a great book. It talks about Vietnam, and until the A seven Echo showed up. Okay, uh, ordnance delivery was, you know, not as accurate as it could have been. Hmm. You know, it really changed it because if you had your forward-looking radar working right or whatever, I mean, it it was a it was a great bomber. Do you still do any flying today? Have any? Kind? I do some. Do you? you know, with other people. General. Uh, yeah, but it's it's a time General distance aviation. heading problem for me because I'm still working right. full time. Yeah. And um, and those are just the challenges of still working. And, you know, very candidly, I care about the, the museum today, but the museum of the future. Sure. Good. All right. So hypothetical question. You could flip a switch and, and get all the knowledge you need to be current again. You go out to the flight line here at Bones's place, which he's got F5s. But imagine there's an A7 and an A4 sitting there. there. You can go goof around for an hour. What are you going to jump in? Well, probably the A4. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, it was a little scooter, right? It was. Yeah. It was Heinemann's hot, hot rod. rod. Yeah. And so um, it was just kind of a fit, okay? It wasn't very, uh, it, you know, the technology in it was very basic, it okay? Was you know, it 50s, was. 50s, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, so to, so to, you know, drop bombs with it, you know, mm -hmm. the aiming reticle and, you know, and all that kind of stuff, you know, it was, it was, it was. I think the toughest thing I ever had to do, probably in an A4, though, was teach somebody to drop bombs and fly the pattern for them once or twice from the back seat. I bet. You know, trying to just say, God, I hope the aiming reticle is somewhere near the ground. <laughs> you know, not just near the bullseye, but near the, Yeah, yeah. you know. You would have hated me as a student slug. I was awful. I could. There were so many things you had to do. You had to be on the right circle, right altitude, airspeed. Oh, you'd be able to pull the right. G I was so bad. Absolutely, 135 <laughs> degrees. Oh really my gosh! Blah, blah, the whole bit, and and so because, okay. So here's what I would tell you is the toughest thing for an aviator to do. Okay, so you're the instructor. You're in a two seat airplane. All right. Okay, and uh, you have. Um, Brief the mission, okay, you uh, have pre-flighted, you know, you've got the student, okay, and you're 35, 40 minutes into the flight, okay, and he or she does something that you think should be done a little bit differently, okay, and you say those magic words, I've got the aircraft, let me show you how I think it should look, okay, so now you have not touched the stick, you're cold as cold can be, right, mm -hmm. okay, 
and you have to do it perfectly because you have one person time. that is watching you, you know, you know, you know, 15 to 18 inches from the instrument panel and the outside of the airplane. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. if you're going to demonstrate a barrel roll or, you know, whatever it may be, you know, or you want to demonstrate what a GCA uh, pattern looks like, you know, whatever, you know, and I always thought that that's the time you've got to be on your game. And uh, and I believe that. Awesome. Well, Jim, you've been a lot of fun. I feel like we should come back to the museum. Any final thoughts? Anything I didn't ask you? Or what should people know if they're coming? And then we'll wrap up with that. I think that they're going to have fun. And I think that they're okay. going to spend longer, longer there than they, than they anticipate. Yeah. Because, okay, so this this is true of events. It's a true of museum, you know, attractions. It doesn't matter what it may be. Is that people are on a clock. Okay, you know, if you said to your wife, what's your wife's name? Beth. Beth. If you said, hey, Beth, let's go, okay, and you walk in, okay, and, you know, you've allocated an hour, and all of a sudden you're realizing that it's not going to be an hour. you got to say, hey, Beth, <laughs> not going to be an hour, and I'm really having a good time. She yeah. goes, well, my time is just okay. You're right, you know? right. And so uh, I think the visit, the guest experience is very worthwhile. Go in there, take your time, come back. Believe it or not, to become a member of the museum doesn't cost that much money. It's online, but it's not, you know, out of sight. Now, there is an Explorer Pass, you know, with Balboa Park. I think it's like $229 gets you two adults, four kids. Kids don't have to be yours. Oh, wow. But okay. is that for, like, different museums? Yeah. So it gets all you sorts all, of all yeah, 16, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, that are there. Okay. So it's a it's very worthwhile. But but you know, um, come to some of our events. Pay attention to us, and if you're if if you like aviation and space and some technology and some fun, I think you'll find that it's uh, very worthwhile. And uh, why aren't you down there as a volunteer when you're not flying? Are you kidding? You know how busy I am already. I got this podcast. I, I just I got... want to give you a hard time. Okay, <laughs> okay. I got to say that to everybody, you know, because uh, you know our volunteers are wonderful. I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we do an annual dinner for them, and I use this word. I said they're the very soul mm. of who we are, of of the of the Air and Space Museum. So I would allocate time okay. or do it in multiple visits. Don't rush yourself because if you do, you'll miss stuff, and you'll be sorry you did. Um, I think it's an extra five bucks if you want to go in the basement because n normally you have to go down an elevator and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Sure, but the right. basement is well worth it. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's uh, it's a world. You know that if you like to work on cars or airplanes or whatever, you'll enjoy going down. It's the big shop with all the tooling and the people oh, and yeah. everything. Yeah. Oh okay. yeah. Yeah. Basement. It's Good. pretty great. And then you see that that Hughes H one. There you go. You know, they just put the wing underneath it the other day because right. it's another airplane that's a combination of wood. Uh, primarily in the wing, and metal and fabric. Very it's amazing what they used to. No doubt. It's not plastic. Jim, this has been a lot of fun, and thank you for taking the time to come share your experience with the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Really enjoyed it. Well, thanks for having us, because I represent an awful lot of great people. Yeah. Thank you.